Father, there's not one cell of Rachel's body that belongs to the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, relief organizations, the World Food Program, uh, are believe that if there's an attack on Mosul, there's going to be an exodus of up to a million refugees. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 25 cable stations from Vermont to New York City. On the internet at thestruggle.org, our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. Over the years, we've been covering the murder by the forces of Israel of Rachel Corey in Rafa in 2003 and the lack of interest by our government in the death of this American citizen. The Bush and Obama administration told the family of Rachel Corey to go to Israel to seek justice. They did just that. But the Israeli justice system said that they would not arrest any of the soldiers involved in the bulldozer crushing of Rachel Corey. So they filed a civil suit, and that has been going on for a decade. Well, they got their final decision from the Israeli High Court just about a week ago. And the answer? Nothing. The court said Rafah was a war zone in 2003, and despite international law about war crimes, nothing that Israeli soldiers do in a war zone can be punished with damages. I did an interview with the parents of Rachel Corey a few days after the court decision. I'm going to play some of the telephone interview, a section that's unexpected, actually ghoulish. It seems that the Israeli doctor who did the autopsy took and has kept portions of the tissue of the corpse of Rachel Corey. He also then admitted, and this is why we wanted the, the further questions to be asked, he admitted that he kept, unbeknownst to us, some tissue from Rachel's body. Our memory says that, he, that they had tissues from basically every organ of her body, but, but it's been a long time now. Anyhow, he said that he kept something from Rachel's body and asked why. He said, well, in case it, there was a lawsuit and the Israeli Defense Force might need it. Now, as Rachel's father, there's not one cell of Rachel's body that belongs to the Israeli Defense Force or the right. Israeli government. Right. And, and we want to know exactly what they have, and we want to have that repatriated with dignity to her family and her country. And so... Um, so that request has been allowed to go forward uh, under the Israeli court system. So it's back down in a magistrate's court now. And we'll see uh, what the best way to proceed with that is. But in reality, uh, it, it, it just appalls me that it takes, you know, a court action to do what I think any decent person or country would have done a decade ago, more than a day. It's been almost 12 years. Starting. I would just like to add to that, that um, we learned, and it was very disturbing uh, to learn during this process, uh, we learned through the media that Dr. Yehuda Hiss had come under scrutiny in Israel um, by, by others, and uh, it w it's been confirmed that he mishandled um, body remains of many others, of Palestinians who were killed, also Jewish Israelis uh, who were killed. And uh, I don't want to go into the detail about all the things that happened, but it involved removal of body parts without permission from families. And uh, it, it was deeply disturbing. It was hard for us to talk about it at the time. But certainly, once we learned about this, that provided even more um, need on our part to find out actually what happened to all of Rachel's remains. And Dr. Yehuda, his, it, it, it really has become a scandal in Israel. Um, and he was finally uh, removed from his position at Abu Kabir Institute. He had been demoted uh, 
as a result of all of this for, for some time, but then finally was removed. I encourage you to listen to the whole interview on our YouTube channel. Our State Department has not met with the family of Rachel Corey since the High Court decision, nor has it issued any kind of statement, not even after a U.S. court awarded hundreds of millions of dollars of Palestinian Authority money to U.S. citizens who lost loved ones due to Palestinian violence. Speaking of interviews, Fida Kishta, who made the film Where Should the Birds Fly, came to Connecticut in February. Just before she came, I did an interview with her over Skype. See it on our YouTube channel. Rachel Corey was killed March 16th, 2003. On March 19th of last year, there was, in some ways, an even more outrageous killing. Yusuf Abu Akr Shawamra was 14 years old. Part of the apartheid separation barrier goes through his family's property in a little town near Hebron. The separation barrier there is really just a fence, and there was a hole in that fence, and young people would go through it to pick vegetables that grew wild on the other side. The hole had been there for two years. It was well known to the Israeli military. They had arrested people just weeks before for going through the fence. On the 19th, Shawamra and two friends went across the barrier in the morning. The IDF was dozens of meters away, and without warning, they shot Shawamra. The Israeli paper Haaretz, their equivalent of our New York Times, said in an editorial that it was nothing short of a war crime. I naively thought that in this case there would actually be some action, some punishment. I was dumb. The IDF had its usual investigation. Last July, it reported to the Israeli human rights group B'Tselem that they had closed the case because there was, quote, no suspicion that the open fire regulations had been breached, unquote. No jailings, no punishments, no censure, no demotions, nothing. Yusuf, rest in peace while we deepen our anger at this outrage and continue to demand justice. On February 15th, a website called the Times of Israel had a fundraiser at the posh Waldorf Astoria Hotel in Manhattan. It featured an Israeli general and Shimon Peres, a former Israeli president, a man who was prime minister in 2006 during the deadly attack on Lebanon and the Kana massacre in Lebanon. A number of groups called for an outdoor protest, but the weather report that day was for minus 10 below with the wind chill. I salute the people who did turn out for that protest. The Times has declared the theme of this inaugural event. They're hoping to do it every year, they say. Telling Israel's story. Hello. This gala, however, will be anything but an honest accounting of the Israeli regime. This event won't mention the 800,000 Palestinians ethnically cleansed by Zionist forces to create a so-called Jewish state on a land with a non-Jewish majority. It won't mention the laws, over 50 and counting, and actually, I think it's getting close to 60 now, that discriminate against Palestinian citizens of Israel on no other basis than the fact that they are not Jewish. It won't mention Israeli massacres of thousands of civilians in Gaza, including children, the elderly, and the disabled, designed to terrorize an indigenous population into submission. It 
won't mention Israel's brutal occupation of the 1967 territories of historic Palestine, with its apartheid wall, system of dehumanizing checkpoints, resource theft, and violent Jewish-only settlements. This morning, Democracy Now! interviewed Patrick Colburn. He's an award-winning journalist for The Independent. That's a British newspaper. Colburn has just finished a book called The Rise of the Islamic State. He says IS has 100,000 soldiers ruling over an area the size of Great Britain and is well financed, in part by donations from rich Saudis. Now, the United States is bombing IS from time to time and supposedly is training the Iraqi army to retake the big city of Mosul. But listen to what Patrick Coburn says about the strategy of the West in its fight against IS. Patrick Coburn, given the brutality that you're describing, why is it that people are, in some cases, as you say, equally scared of the Iraqi military taking over? Because every place that the Shia militia and the, it's mostly the main fighting force of the Baghdad government at the moment is not the Iraqi army. The Iraqi army has actually failed to take back any city in Iraq or town in Iraq since the beginning of last year, since Fallujah fell to ISIS. But the Shia militia that probably have about 120,000 men, the Iraqi army probably has about 40 to 50,000, uh, where they take over cities or towns, they haven't taken many, but where they have taken them over, or villages, they treat all the inhabitants, if they're Sunni Arabs, as if they were members of ISIS. It doesn't matter if these people are completely opposed to ISIS. They're still treated as members of ISIS. So the young men disappear. In some cases, they're killed. In some cases, they're uh, tortured or put in prison. Um, so uh, houses are burnt. People are driven out. And uh, there's one other point, a very important one I'd like to make, which I don't think people have taken on board. As you know, that the uh, U.S. government, the Pentagon, and the Iraqi uh, Prime Minister, Haider al-Abadi, have said there's going to be an offensive to capture Mosul. But the major uh, 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 relief organizations, the World Food Program, uh, are, believe that if there's an attack on Mosul, there's going to be an exodus of up to a million refugees of basically Sunni Arabs live in Mosul, that they're going to flee the city when uh, airstrikes intensify and they believe it's going to come out under attack. At the moment, they couldn't get into the Kurdish region, they're banned, uh, so they're all going to be on the road. So they're pre-positioning supplies for one of the biggest exodus of refugees that we've seen, I don't know for how long, but it's going to be massive. There's going to be terrible suffering and many will die. Already, the self-proclaimed Islamic State controls a swath of land that covers millions and millions of people. Is the Islamic State going to last? And also, if you could respond to this latest identification, supposedly, of the man that has been called Jihadi John, who stands in the video as he was about to execute, for example, the American journalist James Foley. Uh, the Kuwaiti-born Mohammed Mwazi, British security, said that they were following him. The significance of this, three arrests in Brooklyn, uh, these uh, young people were supposedly going to uh, join up with Islamic State state in Syria, the three girls in Britain, the young women who have supposedly have gone to join. Can you put all of this together? Yeah, I mean, there are about sort of said to be 20,000 foreign jihadis who've gone to the Islamic State. One of the amazing things is that they're still quite easily able to cross the Turkish frontier into Syria, uh, to, into the Islamic State despite the fact that Turkey is meant to be part of the coalition to eliminate the Islamic State. At the moment, last year, they had a 100-day campaign in which they captured an area which is larger than Great Britain. 
They defeated the Iraqi army. They defeated the, inflicted defeats on the Syrian army, massive defeats on the Kurds, the Iraqi Kurds, on almost everybody else. Since then, they haven't been quite so successful against the Syrian Kurds and others. But they control pretty well the same area. And they're recruiting vast numbers of people. I was at the uh, battlefront here west of uh, uh, Erbil um, yesterday. And I was talking to a commander. And uh, although he said that ISIS was losing a lot of men in attacks they'd been making, they've still been able to recruit people and recruit people from the local area. I think abroad people get the impression somehow it's all foreign and jihadis. Actually, it isn't. It's mostly Syrians and Iraqis. And there are at least six or seven million people within the confines of the Islamic State. And if you're calling up all the young men, you can put a very large army into the field. Now, to defeat them, we have the Iraqi army here. But as I said earlier, the Iraqi army has not recaptured a single city or town since January last year. So talk of them defeating the Islamic State, of taking Mosul, taking these other cities, looks pretty optimistic. View the whole interview at Democracy Now! It's their February 26th program. We end with more video from the forum after the People's Climate March. What next? We'll start with some of the talk given by Dan Fisher. If you recall, a few weeks ago, we showed a video of a autumn protest he took part in at the Spectra Energy Company, where he was arrested. Spectra is trying to build or expand its pipeline system of methane gas distribution, even though one of its pipelines goes past a nuclear power plant. We'll jump in with the video as Fisher was finishing up his description of his arrest. Eventually, the police showed up. They said if we did not unlock ourselves, we would be arrested. We refused to unlock ourselves. They unlocked us. They asked us to stand up. We refused to stand up. We didn't actively resist, but we went limp. They dragged us away from the bridge, handcuffed us, and lifted us to, into the police cars. Now, this may seem extreme, but I want to ask you, what else should I do as a 25-year-old? I, what else am I to do when I read in the newspapers this past week that we passed four planetary boundaries? Deforestation, species extinction, climate change, and nitrogen cycle disruption. What else am I to do when I go to the People's Climate March and I see 400,000 people marching in front of me and behind me, and that's really inspiring, but then I had a pretty disturbing thought. According to the Climate Vulnerability Forum, 400,000 is, is also the number of people that die every year from climate change impacts. Uh, in, increased hurricane intensity, vector-borne diseases, heat waves. This is a 2012 study. 98% of these 400,000 deaths happening right now every year occur in the global south, in communities that did nothing to cause the climate crisis but are suffering the brunt of the damage. All right, so I'm going to try to move to something more hopeful. <laughs> um, I'm part of a group, Capitalism versus the Climate. We find a lot of hope in history. We can learn from Germany, where people have organized against nuclear power and for renewable energy for decades. And they've succeeded in phasing out nuclear energy. And right now, about 15% of their electricity comes from wind and solar. Uh, from the wind and solar. That, that is hopeful. We can learn from Denmark, where community-owned wind sprang up around the country in the 1970s and the 1980s. We can learn from the anti-nuclear movement right here in this country. In the 70s, thousands of people went to jail for justice, and they succeeded in bringing national attention uh, to the nuclear issue. And with some help from the Three Mile Island disaster, uh, they succeeded in blocking many, many nuclear plants. No new nuclear plants have, built, have been built since 1974. And from 1977 to 2013, no nuclear reactors were built at existing plants either. We can learn from the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico, who built a direct democratic society of up to 300,000 people. They have plenty of oil under the ground, and they could have gotten rich by extracting it, but they decided to keep the oil in the ground where it belongs. We find hope in the fact that there are thousands of solutions. Community-owned wind and solar, Zero waste policies, small scale farming, participatory decision making, uh, which has been put into place 
thousands of times throughout history, from classical Athens to revolutionary Spain to New England town meetings to Occupy Wall Street. And you can find out lots more information of these solutions at our website, capitalismversusclimate.org and anarchyinaction.org, which is a, wi a wiki describing hundreds of horizontally organized societies, communities, movements, and organizations. Now, I also find hope, paradoxically enough, in one of capitalism's worst tendencies. And, and that's the fact that capitalism is becoming increasingly reliant on what the security and peace expert Michael Clare calls extreme energy in his book, The Race for What's Left. Because of depleting conventional sources, the capitalists are becoming more and more dependent on extreme sources. Mountaintop removal for coal, fracking for gas, offshore drilling for oil. Right, this is all terrible, but it, sh it shows that uh, without the constant flow of energy, no matter what, uh, the system can't keep on running, and they're forced to rely on these increasingly unpopular and expensive sources. Now, it's, now replacing the system is daunting, uh, but blocking extreme energy seems a little bit more doable. So I, I want to argue that focusing on extreme energy is a strategic focus for the left. The journalist Naomi Klein writes about Blockadia, which is a global movement of blockades against extreme energy, from the tar sands blockade in Texas, to farmers' blockades against Chevron in Romania, to the Micmac struggle against fracking in New Brunswick, to flood Wall Street in New York, uh, I guess I don't have time for this right now, but in the question and answer, I'd love to talk about how my group in Connecticut played a role in getting UBS to, to back away from funding mountaintop removal coal mining. And this was a major victory against extreme energy, and it, it shows that uh, direct action when combined with community organizing tactics can really make a difference. I'm proud of the role that we played in a uh, campaign against the Keystone XL pipeline. A few years ago, this looked like a done deal. And thanks to people mobilizing around the country, uh, around the world really, um, it still hasn't been built. It's been delayed and delayed, and recent statements by the president uh, make it seem likely that he's going to reject it. Uh, so to conclude, we in Connecticut can make a very serious contribution to the global movement for climate justice. After all, we have Wall Street bankers living in Connecticut, and we can put notices up in their country clubs and churches saying it's time for them to stop funding extreme energy. We can uh, use the state's resources to fund clean renewable energy conservation, and we can cause an important national precedent by demanding the payment of ecological debt to Bridgeport and other ecologically exploited communities. We can team up with other movements, labor, Black Lives Matter, Palestine, uh, other movements that are making a real difference, and uh, I have some other ideas I'll talk about in the question and answer period, but I'm going to be passing around this pledge of resistance, and hopefully you can uh, fill it out and then give it back to me. You don't have to get arrested to make a difference to be a part of the struggle, I promise you that. Uh, we do need a lot of people to uh, campaign against Spectre's expansion, and, and let's not be afraid, finally, to use the most powerful weapons we have. Our words, our actions, our creativity, our courage, our resistance. Let's fight as hard as we can with the knowledge that we may very well have to choose between <laughs> extinction and ecotopia, between annihilation and anarchy, between capitalism and the climate. And finally, a bit of a talk by Jeremy Brecker, who has written Strike and books about climate. He's tried for years to bring together climate and trade union activists. You need to be able to say to working people, this is not a question of jobs versus the environment. Environmental protection, climate protection is not something that's going to threaten or destroy your job. But on the contrary, we are making a sector of the Connecticut economy that is going to create jobs and protect jobs of workers. Uh, we have 50,000 fewer workers at work in Connecticut today than we had before the Great Recession. Most of those people, we should find ways that they can go to work protecting the climate. Second, uh, Connecticut once had a state climate action plan and very detailed plans for uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, at a rapid rate, a rate that was uh, this what's necessary to protect the climate, uh, and it fits our uh, targets for the Connecticut Global uh, Warming Solutions Act, 
which include an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, in, uh, by 2050. And that is now obsolete. We need, need to renew it. We need to have a new strategy for how Connecticut is going to get to where we need to get. And finally, uh, the roundtable is involved in a campaign to, it's the first step of making Connecticut uh, electricity, our electrical system, climate safe. And the, I'm not going to try to go into the details of it, but the core of it is that the utilities, starting with CLNP, have a campaign to make us pay uh, a 60% increase in the fixed rate for electricity and uh, eliminate a large part of the incentive for people to do energy efficiency and put solar collectors on their houses and all the other things we need to do because we're still going to have to pay that fixed rate to CLNP no matter what we do to try to lower our, our electrical usage. Uh, and we have a campaign that got a lot of support in the legislature uh, to re reverse that uh, policy on the part of the utilities and we're going to use that as a first step, the opening salvo, if you will, uh, of an effort to redirect the whole structure of the electrical system toward a distributed energy grid based on renewable energy uh, that can sharply reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the state. So I'll stop right there, and uh, it's great to be with you all. I just want to note that all the video from that forum is on our website. Just go to Video on Climate on our homepage. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle.